In his 1999 autobiography, the physicist Edward Teller wrote this of the group of geniuses gathered together to work on the hydrogen bomb. We are Martians who have come to Earth to change everything. Change everything they did, and among them, of course, was the brilliant mathematician John von Neumann, father of what we now call the von Neumann architecture for modern computing, and of course, so much more. Today is not necessarily about John von Neumann, of course, but it is about a Martian's daughter, Marina von Neumann Whitman, whose own great intellect and considerable business talent have been applied to other economic, social, and education frontiers in our country for almost 40 years. In her new uh, autobiography, The Martian's Daughter, Marina recounts what it was like to grow up in her unique family and then to continue to break new ground as a talented and credentialed woman, making it certainly in some of the most male-dominated boardrooms, classrooms, and org charts of some of the uh, most storied institutions in America. Marina was leaning in long before the phrase leaning in hit the popular vernacular. She is Professor of Business Administration and Public Policy at the University of Michigan, a former Vice President and Chief Economist of General Motors. She was the first woman appointed to the President's Council of Economic Advisors in 1972-73. She took that post from her academic position at Pitt. She is now retired, but had long years of very distinguished service on the boards of directors of Alcoa, J.P. Morgan Chase, Procter & Gamble. She serves on the boards of Harvard and Princeton and of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which is, of course, chaired by our good friend Charles Simone, and she holds honorary degrees from more than 20 colleges and universities. Quite a woman, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome her now. Please, Marina von Neumann Whitman. So good to have Hello, you here. John. Welcome. So good to be here. Thank you very much. I should say, by the way, that I have served on the boards of Harvard and Princeton, but not simultaneously. Ah, okay. <laughs> that would be sort of like serving on the boards of Gimbel's and Macy's at the same so time. So that's true. <laughs> Good point. Well, welcome. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks. And I must say, this is a fabulous museum. I've had a sort of mini tour. I think actually the full tour would take days and days, but. It's pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was so much fun to take you around this morning and, of course, to look at what we call the Johnny Act, but uh, I know that was not your father's favorite phrase for that computer. Well, he liked it, but the Institute for Advanced Study thought it wasn't dignified enough. Ah, okay. So that's why it became the IAS machine, which I think is mu much more boring than the Johnny <laughs> Act. You've written a heck of a book. I just loved it. And there's so much ground to cover uh, in this. But let's start at the beginning, uh, not long before that picture that's there behind us and is on the cover of the book was taken. Um, you had, everyone I'm sure is going to want to know about the time that you spent with your father and, and your memories of him. Uh, but let's start with your mother and your father, because your mother was uh, every bit as remarkable a person in her own way. That's true. That's absolutely true. She was very smart, very glamorous. She had a career that she never intended to and kind of made up as she went along. And um, although she isn't n noted as much in things written about the book, she also was a very important influence. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about her influence, both on you and on, on John. Well, they actually, I think, grew up together in Budapest. Uh, the family lore has it that they met when she was three and he was six or seven at a birthday party. And um, then, somewhat later, obviously, um, they did what I guess today would be called dating, although my mother was very carefully chaperoned. And then in 1930, my father was invited to, um, as a Rockefeller fellow, to teach one term a year at Princeton. And he wanted my mother to come with him, and obviously that meant getting married. So they did, and my mother, I think, first of all, he was pretty fascinating. He was young, he was handsome, he was brilliant. 
Uh, and besides, she had very overprotective parents, and I honestly think that she was very happy to put an ocean between them. <laughs> and and they, uh, they, her parents n never came here until 1939 when my father said, look, there's going to be a war. Um, you mustn't say to my mother. They were divorced, but she still took his advice. And he said, you mustn't go to Hungary. So she said to her parents, well, if you want to see us this year, you have to come here. Well, they were sure they were going to be scalped by wild Indians, but um, they did come for what they thought was a six-week summer vacation, and of course, they never went back. They couldn't go back to Europe at that point? No, they couldn't go back to Europe. I mean, war, they came in June, I guess, and war broke out in August, so obviously they couldn't go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they spent the rest of their lives here, and I guess, one of the reasons, well, my mother went to work during World War II for several reasons. One is that it was unpatri unpatriotic not to. And also, she um, had suddenly the financial responsibility for her parents and her aunt, who had also come. So she felt she ought to at least make a significant contribution to supporting them. So she went to work as a kind of Tilly the Toiler. And within three months, she was a foreman. And within six months, she was supervising the women technicians at radiation laboratory at MIT, where they built uh, radar sets. Mm. And after that, she kind of never looked back. I think it's fascinating, <clears throat> three very <laughs> strong-willed, intelligent women in your father's background, uh, one Mariette, your mother, one Clary, your stepmother, and one you. Now, how did he deal with all of this uh, as a, as a well, husband and father and as, intellect? As far as wives went, he dealt very badly. Um, he was a very gregarious person, but he never really got the hang of marriage. And um, my mother ultimately divorced him, and when it said that when she was asked why she divorced this great genius and married a graduate student in physics, she said, well, how would you like to be married to a national monument? <laughs> but um, the truth is that although they divorced, they kind of maintained a lifetime flirtation relationship which drove their spouses crazy. Um, when she was in sitting out the six weeks in Reno getting her divorce, she would write him letters about what a dreadful place this was, and she would sign off saying, do you, do you love me just a little bit? L love Mariette. And, you know, she was divorcing him. Sure. So um, it, it was an oddball relationship. My stepmother um, was very intelligent. She never had formal education beyond high school, beyond boarding school in England. But when my father um, built the stored program computer, she actually became one of the first programmers and did some pretty fancy programming. Yeah. Unfortunately, she was also um, terribly neurotic, terribly insecure. Every day that he was away from her, he would write her a letter apologizing for some pursued, pursued, perceived sin or other. And she was also very insecure. Sadly, um, she ultimately committed suicide, as her father had. Uh, when I lived with them when I was, I was in high school, she tried very hard to form a good relationship with me. But the truth was that she was not easy to get along with. And now, of course, in my old age, I have enormous sympathy for her, but back then as an adolescent, uh, I was pretty impatient. Mm -hmm. Now, your mother and father had a very unusual arrangement for you, personally, after they divorced, and it was not one you knew about. She was to have custody of you up to a point, and then he was to have custody from that point on. That's right. The, the agreement was, and I, I have the divorce agreement in my safe deposit box, that until I was roughly 12 or 13, I would live with my mother during the school year and spend vacations with my father. And then when I more or less reached high school years, it, the situation would be reversed. 
Their reasoning was apparently that, of course, anybody 